it's good to be with you all again. I've actually been gone for the last several weeks. Uh, two weeks ago, I was officiating a, a wedding of a former student, uh, which was a, a wonderful, wonderful time. And last week, uh, I was standing in a stream and pouring down rain in 47 degree weather with me and 13 of my other brothers in Christ to have a men's retreat. And we, uh, we, uh, I caught one fish on the weekend, so that was totally worth the drive out. But it's good to be with you guys here this morning. Let's pray, because if you read the passage for this week, we need it. So let's pray. Father, I thank you so much. Um, I'm just so I'm just so in awe of you at times to think of that you chose me to be here this morning to be up on here to give your word to your people uh, to help us understand who you are better and what it means to follow you. So, Lord, may your spirit be with me in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, just real quick, I want to give a, a real quick reminder that if you don't know, we send out a weekly email called the Prepared for Sunday that goes out Sunday afternoon, sometimes Monday morning, uh, because that has in it the sermon passage that we're going to be preaching on the next week. So it gives you a whole week to sort of prepare. Our life application Bible study uh, groups use that as their main primary content, and so there's some con- uh, questions that go along with that. But then also, uh, you can use it for your own personal study. It's just a great reason and excuse for us to get around God's word together as community and to show up on Sunday to see what in the world the pastor uh, came up with in preparation for that time. And so just a quick question. Uh, I I heard the laughter earlier, so that was a slight indicator, but how many of you read the passage uh, ahead of the time for this week? Yeah, a good good number of you. Uh, Now, for those of you who read it, there is something in this passage that sort of stands out, isn't there? Now, and I think part of it is because uh, from our perspective, it doesn't necessarily make sense to us. And my fear, though, is, is when I sat down with this passage, is that we could get lost in three verses and miss the overarching theme of what's actually going on in this passage. And I promise I will spend some time trying to unpack those verses, but I want to make sure to keep the main focus, the main focus going on here. So a a quick question is, I don't know, uh, how many of you have ever been out in public or you've seen someone off in a distance uh, and uh, maybe it was at a party or, you know, out shopping somewhere and you have this thought that pops into your mind that you look at them and you go, don't I know that person from somewhere? Don't I know that person from somewhere? How many of you uh, go up to that person and say, don't I know you from somewhere? Where are those people? Okay, they're all all the extroverts outing themselves here this morning. Um, How many of you have ever gone up to a person and been totally wrong uh, about that? Okay, all the same people who put their hands up. Um, uh, I mean, that's never happened to me. Um, But I, I had a moment where that actually happened to me. You know, it's nice when you're the awkward person from time to time to have the awkward thing finally happen to you. Uh, when I was in college at Geneva, and uh, that reminds me, we have some kids from, uh, kids, so sorry, I'm so sorry. We have some students from Grove City College here this morning. Uh, they made the drive down, so if you're a Grover, I mean, give it up for them. I only mention that because as a Geneva grad, they're bitter rivals to me now that they're here this morning. Uh, when I was at uh, Geneva College in our dining hall, uh, you know, to throw out your, uh, your, your tray, uh, it was a pretty simple process. You got up, you, put it, you walked on this other side of this wall, you put it on a conveyor belt, you walked out the other side of the wall. That was it. So one time as a normal person getting up to go set my tray down, I uh, walked out the other side of the wall after performing that act, and I was greeted by a woman who began to sing to me. And she began to sing, Did I ever tell you you're my hero? (laughs) And I stood there going, What in the world? is going on. And the amazing part about that whole thing is that she made it through that whole line of a Bette Midler song before she finally looked at me and said, oh my gosh, you're not the person who I thought you were. (laughs) So stop going up to people in public, folks, (laughs) being confident that you know them because you don't, all right? And in this passage, we are going to see some words, ideas, and phrases that are going to make us go, don't I know you from somewhere? Don't I know you from somewhere? 
And I'm not even going to make you wait to the end of the sermon uh, to you know, see the familiar ideas lurking around here. I'm going to give it to you right up front. But the ideas that we're going to see are actually from the great commission of Jesus, where he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So Jesus comes into our world, and all along the way, he's instructing people on how to love God, and he calls this very specific group of men to be his disciples, uh, who he trains for ministry, and then he goes and he dies for our sins, he lives the life we should have lived, and he dies the death we deserve to die, and then he rises from the grave, and then he declares power and authority, and he grants them to go into the world to bring the kingdom of God. And what we're going to see here in this passage this morning is what I am calling the great commission of Moses and Aaron. And partly why it's and Aaron is because Moses is the initial guy and the primary person that God calls, but he utilizes Aaron because of Moses' nervousness to speak. And so Moses and Aaron have been called to a task, and God gives them what he wants them to do and say, and then he commissions them for that task. And what this tells us is that God has a great history of entrusting people with a mission, and now it is their responsibility to pass it on to others. And here is a pattern principle that we learn about God in Scripture, and I want you to remember this. This is the main point of this passage, is that God's people pass on what God places in our hands. That God's people, Pass on what God places in our hands. And let's have that on our hearts as we begin to tackle this text today. Uh, And if you have your Bible or your Exodus journal, you can take that out now. If you don't have a Bible or an Exodus journal, please raise your hand nice and high, and one of our ushers will get one to you. If you don't have one, you could take that with you as a gift. We are going to open up to Exodus chapter 4, starting at verse 18. Exodus chapter 4 starting at verse 18. Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, please, go back to my brothers in Egypt. please let me go back to my brothers in Egypt to see whether or not they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, go in peace. So after this back and forth between God and Moses for about 17 verses, Moses finally decides that he's going to go to Egypt and fulfill this calling to get his people out of the land of slavery. And his first stop is to see his father-in-law and ask for his blessing to go. Now you have to understand that this is no small ask. This would be a loss to Jethro. Moses is likely the primary person who's tending the flocks and keeping um, you know, them Uh, in a necessary place for them to survive. And Jethro at this point is probably a lot older, uh, and so he would require and need Moses a lot more. And yet, he blesses Moses to go. And then we see in verse 19 and 20, And the Lord said to Moses and Midian, Go back to Egypt, for all the men who were seeking your life are dead. So Moses took his wife and his sons and had them ride on a donkey, and went back to the land of Egypt, and Moses took the staff of God in his hand. Now, when we read that, doesn't anyone in here have a moment where they go, don't I know you from somewhere? Almost verbatim the exact words. Does anybody want to take a guess on maybe another place of where that is very familiar language? Anybody? Yes, Joseph, very good. Look at this from Matthew chapter 2, verses 19 through 21. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and he took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. So we have Moses who takes his wife and children from Midian to Egypt. Then we have Joseph who takes his wife and child from Egypt to Israel. Now you have to remember that New Testament writers are writing to Old Testament readers. I'll say that again. New Testament writers are writing to Old Testament readers, especially Matthew, who writes to a predominantly Jewish audience. And so when they see this, they almost automatically go, oh my gosh, there's a parallel here between Moses 
and Jesus that's happening in this moment. This is a very cool Bible thing that they would probably pick up on. And then it also says, and Moses took the staff of God in his hand. And to take the staff, uh, commentator said it's, it represents the power of God, the comfort of his presence. One commentator said he did not go into the arena of Egypt unprepared and unprotected. That Moses knew that he was going to a hostile place where things were going to be difficult, and he had that staff with him, and God gave him that staff. And God gives Moses this staff, something that would communicate the nearness of his presence. And I imagine that that staff would serve as a great comfort to Moses. He could look at it on his way while he's wondering, what in the world am I doing? And he could be reminded of God's word to him. If only God gave us something that we could access on a regular basis to communicate his nearness, to give us comfort, to remind us of who he is. Oh, wait. He already has. God hasn't given us a staff, but he has given us a sword. God's word has power like you wouldn't believe. The gospel is the power of God to those who would believe. Do you and I cling to God's word like Moses clung to the staff to be reminded daily of the power and presence of God in your life? Do we head into the arena daily prepared and protected by the truth of God's word? And as we know, it can be a hostile place out there sometimes. We need to be prepared and to know that God is with us daily. Get in to his word. We need to cling to God's word like Moses clings to the staff. Verse 21. And the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power. And I love when God uses the word when here. You know, he's taken if off the table. He has solidified Moses' mission. Now, in, this, in these couple, this verse here, you could see a couple phrases that make you go a little bit like, don't I know you from somewhere? Now, at this point, we have seen which word three times now? Anybody want to point it out? Go. We have seen go three times, which is the primary word that has been used, that is used by Jesus in the Great Commission. Therefore, go. Don't stay. Go. You have a mission that you're going to do. And if you haven't been circling that in your journal to this point, I would highly recommend at this point to circle the three times go shows up. Now, God is reminding Moses here of what he wants him to do. Do all the miracles that I have put in your power. He's saying to him, I am giving you authority. What did Jesus say to his disciples? He says, I want, I want you to teach people to obey everything that I have commanded you. I'm giving you this power. Because all authority now belongs to me and you belong to me as well. You know, when Jesus gives this mission, this task to his disciples, he's not doing a new thing, folks. He's not creating new patterns of life or coming up with new ideas of what he wants people to do in the world. He's just doing what he's always done. He's giving to his people what he wants them to pass on. He says, Moses, I have given you a specific list of things and to do and say, so do them and say them. Don't be disobedient and keep all that to yourself. Do what I tell you because that will benefit those who will listen to what I have to say to them. Then it goes on and says, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you will shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. Now, as Moses is now resolved to take on this task with the staff of God in his hands, God throws him a little bit of a curveball here. He tells Moses that Pharaoh's heart will be hardened, that there will be some resistance, that this will not be a walk in the park. This will not be easy. And yet, I want us to take note that Moses is still resolute to move forward despite the future prediction of resistance. One way to know that you're doing God's work is probably if you're met with some kind of resistance. And that's what Moses is going to see here. 
And then there's this very interesting dialogue about the firstborn son. It's not to say that our firstborn sons aren't special to us or anything like that, but there was just something very significant about the firstborn son in the ancient Near East, especially during this time frame. They are the heirs to the estate. They are precious to carry on the lineage. Fathers were very highly protective of them. And one commentator points out that this is the first time that God calls Israel his son. And they say that is significant because it denotes a different kind of relationship between a God and their people, which was very different from the concepts of the gods at the time. The concept of, God, of, of gods at the time was, you know, master and servant or ruler and subjects, not with Yahweh. It's father and son. Intimate, personal, valuable. That Israel is God's son, divinely chosen, protected, and valuable in his sight. And I read that with our hearts just full of everything that's going on in that country right now of everything that is happening that we don't understand. But let me just say this. Apparently, these people don't read history books because history has taught us that attacking Israel is a very bad idea because they always remain and the attackers are gone. It just happens because God is Israel precious in his sight. They are so valuable to God that God will threaten Pharaoh's firstborns as a means of justice and judgment towards Pharaoh's abuse of Israel. And that threat of taking the life of the firstborn will be a very serious threat to Pharaoh. And as we're getting enthralled with what God is doing in this passage, we have finally arrived at these three verses that make people go, huh, so here's what I want to do. I'm going to read these three passages for us, and then I'm going to do my absolute best to unpack this so that we can see what in the world may be happening here and where it might fit in with the narrative. Okay? You with me? Here we go. Verses 24 through 26. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met him, that's Moses, and sought to put him to death. Then Zipporah took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it and said, Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him alone. It was then that she said, A bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. <laughs> Teach the Bible, they said. <laughs> It'll be fun, they said. My brothers and sisters, I cannot even begin to tell you how many commentaries I read, how many videos I watched in an attempt to understand what in the world is going on in this passage. And here is my favorite line from one of the commentators named David Pinchansky. He says, Bible scholars love this passage because it's totally incomprehensible. We'll give it a shot. All right, we're going to go this morning. All right, so I think this, <laughs> this doesn't make sense. It, and, and I think if this happens earlier, it might make a little bit more sense. But the big lead up, and then, and then you know, you get Moses in the position where he's like, uh, he's made the decision to go, and now you're coming to try to take him out? What in the world is going on here? Okay, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you three clues from the passage. I'm going to give you one main issue at hand. And we're going to have a recap, and I hope that'll be helpful. Trust me, I'm going to say this up front. I am not going to be able to answer all of the questions that are in this text, okay? And these three verses. I'm not going to be able to answer them all, but I'm going to give us a, a, a more appointed sort of, you know, absolute as best as we absolutely can. Because if Bible scholars haven't quite figured this out, uh, I, I'm going to do my best for you guys. All right, here, clue number one has to do with Zipporah. That whatever means that God was using to kill Moses or to threaten Moses' life was visible to Zipporah. Now, commentators say that it must have been some sort of onset illness, like very fast-acting illness, that incapacitated him and, and took him out to the place where she noticed that something was wrong and that it was threatening 
to his life. And that was an interesting take to me because I always thought God was kind of like, ah, and then he was going to get Moses in that moment. No, it was something a little bit more natural that was happening. Now, the interesting thing is that she realizes the problem and that she acts to correct it. A little bit more on that in a second. The second clue is the mentioning of the firstborn son in the previous verse, that God had just shared with Moses the value of the firstborn son. So Zipporah turning to Moses' son Gershom communicates, to circumcise him, to communicate that she understood what was happening and it had something to do with the firstborn son. Number three, God's judgment. His judgment would only mean that Moses has violated God in some way. That Moses in this moment is not right with God. Now you have to see in the passage it says God sought to do it. And you and I both know that if God wanted to kill Moses, he could have killed Moses. But in his mercy, he allows a window of opportunity for Zipporah to intervene and act which does two things. One, allows his mercy to keep Moses alive, and number two, communicate that whatever it is that he has violated God with, it is a serious thing. So here is, oh, and right after that, uh, after the circumcision of the firstborn son is when he relents, when God relents his judgment. So this tells us the issue at hand, and the issue at hand has to do with covenant and circumcision, okay? You have to remember that God gave the people of Israel this command through Abraham to circumcise the firstborn son. Now, this was typically the father's job. Now, as many people like to ask as a pretty straightforward, basic question is, Lord, why circumcision to communicate the sealing of your promises with your people? One person said, it's creepy, it's creepy, like why in the world, why not like, like some sort of like, like clip the top of my earlobe or something, right? Something that's a little bit more visible, but as people sort of put it together, they say, okay, maybe here's sort of two reasons why, particularly circumcision, because it's bloody and it's intimate. It's bloody to show the grotesqueness of sin, but it's intimate because of the relationship that now exists between uh, God and his people based on the area of which circumcision is proceeded, or or, or, or which it's applied. Now, circumcision was the mark of the covenant because it symbolized a commitment uh, between God uh, and the people. It was the sealing of the promises of God, and circumcision served as a permanent reminder of those promises. And to not obey the Lord, it says in Genesis 17, is to be cut off from the people. And so Moses' job as a Hebrew father to perform his duty, he punted on. And he failed to do it. And because of that, God was bringing judgment on Moses. And this goes back to hearing the commands of God and being obedient to his word. That Moses had failed as a Hebrew man to perform this duty that, si- that sealed the sign of the covenant between God and his people because he was about to send Moses to be the leader of the covenant people of God who he himself had not sealed that covenant. And then somehow, his Midian wife figures out that this is a problem. Now, what commentators say, this is sort of conjecture, so take it for what it is. M- remember, totally incomprehensible passage, right? Right? They, said, they, they basically say, because she was aware and acted so fast, there's a great chance that they probably had a conversation about circumcising Gershom at some point along the way, and she was so grotesque at the act that she pushed back on Moses, and he sort of punted on his responsibilities as a Hebrew father. And now, since Moses is likely incapacitated, she jumps into action, and she does it herself. Now, some people ask, why in the world does Zipporah say, bridegroom of blood. And this is where you love commentators because there's one that said that this is a term of endearment. It's a weird term of endearment. And the others that say this is a term of disgust towards God. Okay? Either way, my brothers and sisters, listen to this. 
It is the bloodshed and the circumcision of the firstborn son that seals the covenant and relents the judgment of God upon Moses. I will say that one more time. It is the blood of the firstborn, uh, uh, firstborn son, the shedding of the blood of the firstborn son, is what relents God's judgment upon Moses. When you hear that, don't you kind of go, don't I know you from somewhere? How are we saved? Through the blood of the bridegroom, who is also the firstborn son. The one who stood in our place to be cut off as though he was the one who was disobedient. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so what's the recap here? Here's the recap for us. That God brings judgment on Moses because he's not right with God. He's not right with God because as a Hebrew father, he failed to perform the duties that would seal the covenant between Moses and God. Then Zipporah jumps into action and circumcises Gershom, a bloody and intimate moment in order to make Moses right with God. And then God relents because of the sign of the covenant being sealed, and Moses is now made right with God, and he's able to finish his commissioning work. There it is, folks. I hope that was helpful. If it wasn't, you can email ajackley at ncc and wexford. Dot O R G. <laughs> Thanks, Sandra. I knew that was from you. Whew. All right. Well, I did something. I don't know if I did it. But here, let me get us slightly back on track here, because I know that can derail us. But I want you to notice that after the circumcision of the firstborn son, Moses is revived. And then he begins this God-given mission and said, let's see what happens next. This is verses 27 through 31. The Lord said to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he went and met at the mountain of God and kissed him. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord with which he had sent him to speak and all the signs that he had commanded him to do. Then Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the people of Israel Aaron spoke all the words that the Lord had spoken to Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people. So what's going on in this passage here? Well, God tells Aaron to go meet with Moses, and he does. And then when he got there, what did Moses do? He told them all the words, told Aaron all the words that God wanted him to say, and he showed him all the signs. And what happened after that? Aaron spoke the words that Moses gave to him from God, to the people, and they all believed. They did all the signs. You want to know what this tells us? This tells us that discipleship is not a New Testament idea. What did Moses do? He passed on to Aaron what God placed in his hands. What did Aaron do? He passed on to the people what God placed in Moses' hands. You're picking up a pattern here. That God gives us what he wants us to pass on. It was their duty and responsibility to others to give what God revealed to them. It was necessary for them to follow through in order that the Israelites may be free. Do you guys understand that God is in the business of entrusting human beings with his words and his revelation that we may live and love like Jesus and teach others to do the same? How are we not humbled by that on the daily basis? I'm a mess. You're a mess. We're a mess together, and yet somehow God calls us to reveal himself to us so that he may send us out into the world to tell a messy world about how great our God is? And as we close, I have a question for us. What will we pass on? This is a very specific question. Because what's clear in the church is that we're passing on something. We're always passing on something. But the question is, is it the right thing? Is it the right thing? We can, if we pass on that church involvement matters, people will pick up on how that matters. If we, pack on, uh, if we, if we um, uh, pass on that serving in the community matters, people will pick up on that serving in the community matters. If we pass, off the important, or pass on the importance of a personal Bible study in our own lives, that we're eating up God's word on the regular, and that we're doing it in community, 
around other Christians, people will pick up on that being of value and important. But it is equally true that we can end up passing on bad habits as well. We're judgmental towards other people. Where we only attend church on Christmas and Easter. How we express ourselves in a worship setting. Now, I want to tell you a story that um, I'm not really mad about this. And I don't say this story to try to guilt anybody. But I want to tell it to give you some perspective of this idea of what we pass on. This past uh, uh, Easter, uh, my kids were up here in the service. And, uh, you know, as always, Matt and Zuli were leading us in worship, and she, in, uh, she invited, Zuli invited everybody to start clapping along with us, and so we're all clapping along together. And then my daughter, who was standing, my daughter was eight, uh, standing right in front of me, she starts clapping along with it, going on with it. Uh, but then we get to about the end of the first chorus, and the clap starts slowing down a little bit, all right? And then what was interesting is my daughter looked around, and started seeing people stop clapping, and guess what she did? She stopped clapping too. My brothers and sisters, that was a discipleship moment that we need to pay attention that yes, even young people are looking towards us to see what it is that we are giving for them to receive in order for us to pass that on to the next generation even little things like that, and that we have such a great responsibility. I want you to think about this. One day, everybody in this room is going to be dead and gone. And what we have passed on to the next generation will be what we have considered the most important things about the Christian faith. And it's possible for us to know exactly what God wants us to pass on and just ignore it and do our own things in sake of tradition. And I think the unattended consequences is what we're passing on to younger people. And based on the current statistics of 18 to 25 year olds, what we've passed on and tried to teach them has kept them away from the church. So I want to give us eight things this morning as New Community Church that we should be passing on. Not only to those who show up here, but for every generation afterwards. Eight things that we should be passing on. Number one is that God's word is true and it it has power. In our own lives and when we gather together around God's word and community, that it's not just information we get, but it's information that transforms our lives. Number two, prayer is critical. That we cannot go through a single day without having communion with God and talking with him because we are utterly dependent upon him. That we know instinctively to turn, God, turn to God on a regular basis because it's a knee-jerk reaction of what it means to follow him. Number three, that worship is central. Everybody in this room worships something. But all the other things you worship outside of God are only going to take, to you, take from you. They're never going to give to you. But it's only the Lord Jesus Christ and our great God through the Spirit that deserves our worship because not only does he take our lives upon himself, our sinful lives upon himself, and cancel our debt, but that he invites us into his life and he gives us eternal life to live out. And that is a reason to worship him. Number four, following Jesus is the greatest thing that anyone could ever do. Following Jesus is the greatest thing that anyone can ever do. The Christian faith is an adventure. And if you're bored being a Christian, you're doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong. Number five, the gospel is the greatest hope for this world. When we walk outside these doors and we look at what's going on in the news, we look at what's going on in the world, it feels hopeless right now. The, the amount of anxiety and stress levels in people statistically is almost higher than it's ever been. And we have a living hope within us to give to people about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why are we keeping that inside ourselves? Number six, the church is a haven from a cold and cruel world where people can be loved through grace and truth. Emphasis on the truth. Because you have some churches that they emphasize all grace and all acceptance, and then you have some churches that emphasize all truth and all strictness. But the Bible tells us it's both. That we are saved by grace, but we are changed by truth. Number seven, 
and that every believer can contribute now to the body of Christ and the kingdom of God. I don't care what your age is. You have a purpose to serve not only in this church, but also out in the world where God's, uh, God's kingdom is being built out in those places. And then we are those kingdom builders. And number eight is teaching others one through seven is our God-given responsibility. This is why we gather for worship. Teach God's word weekly. Connect in small group communities. Build relationships at events and cafe. Go on mission trips. This is why we have a whole page on our website dedicated to the local serving opportunities that you guys can go and work at to bring God's kingdom there because these are the things that we want to pass on. What God is doing with Moses and Aaron is giving them what he wants them to pass on to the people and that pattern repeats itself for centuries. God's people pass on what God places in our hands. Will it die with us or will we pass on the truth of God? My prayer is that it's the latter. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. Give you praise for who you are and that you so wonderfully Choose us in a way we couldn't understand to pass on what you have placed in our hands, Lord. So let us be faithful to do that well. Be with us, Lord. Give us the confidence that we need. You tell us that you are with us when we do that, and we are gonna trust that. So thank you, God, for what you have shared with us today. And I pray, God, that you, you help us each and every day that we walk in this world. In Jesus' name, amen.